Hello, and welcome to a LexisNexis sponsored webinar titled, What's Third Party Risk Got to Do With It? My name is Jacob, and I will be the moderator for the presentation today. A few notes before we begin. If you have a question for the presenter during today's session, please submit them by writing in the question box. You can submit them at any time, but we will reserve time at the end of the presentation for Q&A. If we do not have enough time to answer all of the questions, we will answer them by email after the live session. A copy of the PowerPoint presentation will be available via the chat. Now I would like to turn to today's presentation over to our speakers, uh, Pawana Berlakoti, a Global Product Manager, Entity Due Diligence and Risk Monitoring with LexisNexis, and Lorena Esparza, Business Development Manager, Entity Due Diligent, Diligence and Risk Monitoring with LexisNexis. Welcome, and I'll turn it over to the presenters. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lorena Esparza. And I am a uh, business development manager specializing in uh, entity due diligence and ongoing risk monitoring. I've been doing this with LexisNexis since, since about uh, 2011, so quite a few years. And this has been the exclusive focus of my role with the organization. And the focus, of course, being not just in understanding internally how LexisNexis partners in this particular field, but more about understanding how the market is managing due diligence risk management and this, this ever-growing need for ongoing risk monitoring. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Pawana. Thank you, Lorena. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I am Pawana Burlakoti. I am a product lead here at uh, LexisNexis. I focus on our entity due diligence and monitoring portfolio. Um, it hosts um, a host of um, products around uh, diligence and, and risk monitoring for your entities. I have been a, a career product manager, so to speak, for some time now, and I really want to understand our customer pain points, what the market drivers are, are, how the users really benefit from using our tools and really delivering solutions that makes their workplace um, or their workflow um, easier to manage. Um, so this is uh, constant discovery and learning because uh, risk in itself is a quite a dynamic space. So we are constantly uncovering new drivers and new uh, regulations in place that makes our customers then have to do something more or something more intense. Uh, so we are just here to make sure that we are ready um, when our customers are ready to take part in a diligence and monitoring process. So, Lorena, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Pawana. So we're going to start by defining third parties. And this may seem like a really basic or very rudimentary, uh, rudimentary starting point for a conversation. Normally, who we invite to these uh, presentations are people in risk management, in procurement, in supply chain, in compliance. And so we all think that we should know what a third party means. But what uh, if, if uh, my experience has taught me anything is that I should never presume or assume that my audience understands what we mean by third parties. Um, interestingly enough, I was sitting with a client one time who pointed out to me that it's kind of ironic we call it third party, third party risk because the definition of third party in a dictionary is very actually contradictory to how we utilize the, the phrase third party in, in a compliance or risk management context. So defining third parties, who or what is a third party? And, and like this one uh, client uh, pointed out, most textbooks or all textbooks will define third parties as a person or a group besides the two primarily involved in a situation or a transaction. But in the context of our world, a third party is exactly the opposite. And a great definition was provided by ISO. Um, so in ISO speak, a third party includes a person or entity that is independent of the organization. Uh, so we're talking about not employees. So we have the organization, we have employees, and a third party is anyone involved in a transaction with that organization who is a customer, a client, a vendor, a supplier, a business partner, joint venture partners, consultants, 
Um, and really, there are variations to, to this list. Uh, I want to say that this list is ever changing because it kind of is. But these are the core third parties that uh, are categories of third parties that, that most of, of the market encounters when we're talking about third party and the risk involved with doing business with third parties. So the question then becomes, are all third parties equal? And again, this is really about just laying a foundation for where we're going to go with this presentation. Uh, and, and we'll come back to this concept of third party risk management and how we implement a program around mitigating third party risk. But this is really to just lay a foundation. So it's important to understand that not all third parties are equal. The exposure that a third party has to an organization varies depending on a number of factors, and those factors include the location, whether it's the location of the third party or where the transaction will occur. Uh, it could involve the industry itself. Some industries lend themselves to higher risk than other industries. Uh, and, and, and we can talk, we're going to talk a little bit more detail about that as, as we go through our presentation. And then a third that becomes, has been important, especially in the financial market, but we're finding it really starting to take hold uh, and priority across other uh, types of, of verticals, not just in the financial vertical, is the spend. How much are you spending with a particular third party? Because that codependency or that inter, inter, interdependence with a third party can really impact your entity and expose you to greater risk. So spend does become a, a rather significant factor in determining the risk involved with doing business with that particular uh, third party. So what do we mean by that third party risk uh, and why is risk management important? So risk it, with regards to third parties can really be divided into these core categories. Uh, we have strategic risks, reputational risks, operational risks, transaction and credit or, or financial risks. And uh, to just quickly go through some definitions here, strategic risk is the risk arising from an adverse business decision or the failure to implement appropriate business decisions in a, in a manner that is consistent with the, uh, the entities or, or your organization's uh, strategic goals. Um, so, for example, the use of a third party to perform banking functions or to offer products or services that do not help the financial institution achieve corporate strategic goals and provide um, adequate return on those investments exposes that financial institution to strategic risk. Um, I think one of the things that we're seeing uh, in, in sort of growing exponentially is the quantifiable reputational risks to organizations. And when we're talking about reputation risk, what we're really talking about is negative public opinion. So impacts, um, the impact that a third party uh, involvement can have on your organization, uh, whether it's directly through the transaction with that third party or um, that third party doing uh, independent acts of your organization, they can still sort of tangentially expose you to reputational concerns. Um, operational risks include the risk of uh, uh, the loss of resulting uh, loss resulting from inadequate or failed internal processes, people and systems, or from external events. And uh, transaction risk is the risk arising from problems with service or product delivery. Uh, and finally, credit risk is a risk that a third party or any other creditor necessary to um, necessary to the third party relationship is unable to meet the terms of the uh, contractual arrangements. Uh, with your organization. So uh, some other risks that we didn't include in here, compliance risk, uh, pretty, um, I think this is sort of, we think of it as a, a sort of a foundational risk. Uh, and this really is, uh, arises from violations of laws, rules, or regulations, or from just non-compliance with internal policies or procedures. So um, these could be mandates that your organization has, or protocols that your organization has set out uh, that, uh, that it could, uh, could also arise as a, as a risk.
And we see here again, just uh, uh, looks like I, I probably skipped the slide here. Let me uh, catch up with myself. So a little bit about the foundation behind the types of risks that are out there. Um, and Pawana is going to share with us uh, what has changed in the business environment to make risk management necessary. Sure, thank you, Lorena. Um, so if you uh, don't mind just going to the next slide and just land there while I give a little bit of an introduction around, uh, you know, why uh, this, this is not a brand new concept, right? So companies for, for centuries have been doing their own kind of risk identification and risk mitigation in various ways. It's just that, uh, you know, now the, the economy is quite global and the companies have large global footprints and it also has a quite wider and open kind of a transparent reach to its customers. And that lot more spotlight is on how the companies are doing businesses. And there are various externals and internal drivers on how, um, how they are being monitored and what the expectation is for a company. So if you can just go to the, the next slide, because I will cover a lot of these details here. So one of the, the leading ones, especially for our US market would be the FCPA or the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. And this is a, an enforcement where uh, if you are found to be violating certain rules and regulations put in place by FCPA, there is a quite a significant uh, penalty that is, um, that is insured on the, the company or your organization. So if you just look at the type of fines that were as, you know, just done in Q2 this year, 2019, it's in 583 million in fines. And the companies uh, that were found guilty of engaging in some of these were around the anti-bribery and corruption laws and violating it. And this particular example goes back to how, even though the, the origin of the company was in Brazil, their um, their stock or the company's stock was traded in in U.S. in the New York Stock Exchange, so a company cannot just uh, shield itself anymore by being in a foreign location or you know hiding uh, the the true place of origin by having multiple branches everywhere. And so and the reg regulations are getting tighter. They are getting smarter about spotting um, breaks in the diligence process. Um, and one of the things that is quite useful for the companies is to engage in a reasonable due diligence and a background investigation of their third parties. Um, it means that sometimes, despite the best effort, a company might still engage in a business, an active business with a third party that is seemed risky, um, or you did not have visibility into the true risk exposure of that third party. But the fact that you were uh, doing your reasonable act and you were conducting a proper due diligence with full auditing trails to find out everything that could be risky uh, about that third party gives a little bit of a leeway in terms of the, at least uh, for FCPA to show that you have done something, you have engaged in a, a vetting process, engaged in a dil diligence process, and you just happen to be uncovering risk either at later point in future, or you just did not know, there is sometimes the reduced penalty or complete wave of uh, fines as well. And the other driver, uh, if we can go to the next one, is the, the ISO, and, and Lorena, you covered a little bit in your introduction as well. So there's the ISO 37001, and this was really, uh, this is an international um, standard organization, and their standard for validating the anti-bribery and co corruption compliance programs. And this has been an accumulation of 15 years of work that they did to, to outline what the best practice looks like. Therefore, it also gives them visibility into when things are not um, in that best practice uh, uh, line. So this is, again, multiple bodies working together across the continent to really clamp down on the anti-bribery and corruption practices that's been happening. And there is a high cost of this, right? So there's $3.6 trillion, in, trillion dollars in forms of bribe and, and stolen money throughout the globe. Uh, so if you look at it, that's you know, that's larger than some countries' GDP. That's a lot of money that's just kind of leaking and going into the hands where it should not be going into. And if we can just go to the, the next one. Uh, this is a little bit of a, a little bit more familiar, perhaps, the Anti-Bribery and Corruption and Anti-Money Laundering Act. 
Um, this one is, um, again, it's around how um, wide uh, some of these webs can be. So corruption doesn't just happen, just, you know, there are two parties exchanging right in front of each other, like the, the image is here. Sometimes it's quite hidden. Uh, in this example, there was a settlement of $965 million by the Swedish company, and they were engaging with the president of Uzbekistan, where they were um, donating money in terms of, you know, cost, operation, charitable donations, and it just looked like they were doing business, um, but a lot of it was actually a payment um, and a corruption payment, and there was a lot of money laundering happening. So when you look at, and one of the, the points, Laura, and I, you touched on earlier was around spend. How much are you spending with a particular company? If it seems unusually high, is the cost or the spend truly for the the, the goods and services you purchase, or is there something else going on that is increasingly become a focus as well? And if we can go to yeah the next one, there is um, so others. So those are the regulatory drivers, and there are other drivers as well that is quite strong. So we just call them kind of a ESG, which is the environmental, social, and governance, and this is a non-financial indicator. So you can always look at the health of the company through the credit data and various other things, but if you are trying to look at how does the company actually operate? Are they good citizens of the world, for example? There is increased focus on evaluating a company's health uh, by measuring their ESG score, for example. And the driver here is really who this customer, these companies are servicing. And 73% of the global consumers say that they will change their consumption habits to reduce the impact on the environment. So this very hyper aware, very connected uh, set of customer or the consumer group that the companies are targeting to, to do business with and how they perceive uh, that they are doing this, um, you know, are they engaged in ethical behaviors? Are they socially, environmentally responsible companies? Do they have fair labor practices? All of the, these start to mean quite a lot to the consumer base and the companies in turn have an effort to, to do good. Uh, for us to make changes and that are positive towards the environment, social uh, structure, but also to attract and retain the customers that they, they already do business with. And in 2017, 83% of the millennials, the largest consumer group, um, said that it was extremely or very important for them that the companies um, implemented programs to improve on the environment. So, you know, just reducing the carbon footprint and things that they are doing to, to overall become a good business that they want to buy from. Uh, the, I, um, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead, Juana. No. I was just going to say, um, just to, to play on this point here you just made, that, uh, you know, we, we see so many memes about millennials, but what I'm noticing as I speak to, to customers and potentially new customers on a daily basis, um, they're incredibly, this, this particular segment, this particular generation is incredibly powerful. And I find more and more of the professionals that I'm speaking with are, are, are less and less interested in more of the sort of institutionally established AML or KYC type of risk management programs and they're really focusing on this ESG um, organizations have entire departments now um, you know with with strategies and, and dollars behind it to develop their ESG program and and score highly they're really paying a lot of attention to this so it's yeah. uh, I just thought I'd share that sort of from a real world example yeah and that's that's quite uh, quite common right because now you know as consumers and even as employees right you are going to ask right what kind of practices does my company have you know am I you know or I'm just corporate social responsibilities right am I a socially responsible company do I want to work there for example so a lot goes into evaluating uh, so and so the health right quote unquote the health of the company and it is quite broadening out into oh how are you performing in these ESG categories and how are 
are you performing in your the corporate social responsibility categories? And do I want to buy from you? Do I want to work for you? Do I want to invest in you? Uh, which I will cover again. Um, so if we can just go to the next one, because this is a continuation in the ESG here. Um, again, this is a, a generic term, right? So this is um, so credit score being long established uh, financial health. This is uh, ESG has become the non-financial indicator of your company health. And there are quite, um, so it's a framework. Um, ESG is not something you just go and buy a report on something, right? So sometimes companies do have to engage and try to follow some of the framework established by United Nations Global Compact, the Sustainable Development Goals, right? Uh, there is various other boards, and these are just examples of the four. Um, and there are, you know, there's the European Federation um, of the Financial Analyst Societies, and they have said that, oh, we need to measure against energy efficiencies, greenhouse gas, staff turnover, uh, training and qualifications, maturity of the workforce, uh, litigation risks, so how often do your employees not show up to work, right? So all of those things kind of giving this, this micro level um, example of how the company is per, um, performing. And if you're really putting this in context of a third party, you are really looking at the subtle uh, things that are happening within the organization on how Either they might be a really, really good business partner, a good third party for you, for your long-term success, or this might be the one that's going to affiliate you on the, in a negative way because you are seen you know, as a partner uh, or enable, enabler to this kind of practices within your third party. And especially if you are a large organization and you, you do, you're responsible for a significant portion of your third party's revenue, uh, it's going to look like you are also, also partially responsible for not uncovering certain things that your company is doing. And then a simple example could be, you know, they have very unfair labor practices. They, you know, don't allow unionized uh, workforce, for example, or they're constantly being, you know, there's a class action lawsuit all the time. There is a workforce dispute. If it's a manufacturing industry, you're looking at really high level of OSHA violations, maybe a lot of injury at work. And then you do kind of start getting signals that maybe there is something uh, not so healthy about this company that you want to investigate further. Okay. And if I go to this one, so this is again around, uh, this was a survey uh, done by PricewaterhouseCoopers. So this is around, there are 17 uh, different goals set by United Nations in 2015. And these goals, so there are 15 year goals. So by 2030, they want to be able to, you know, end poverty and protect the planet and ensure prosperity for all, right? Very UN sounding goal, right? But it does have a quite, um, a quite a, you know, tangible impact on how how these companies grow and how they invest and what they choose to invest in. So it says 65% of the corporations says that, you know, the, the ESG, the environmental, social and governance mm -hmm. is very important to their business strategy. And there are 31% of investors that say that it's very important for them uh, to have a proper visibility into the ESG before making an investment decision. So there's quite a lot of money on the table where um, there are, you know, um, investors, there are, there are subclasses of investor who are making um, conscious choice to only put their money and their investment in companies that align with the ESG goals that they have. Uh, this is not just individual investors, right? Larger companies purchasing shares of other companies as well. And there are a couple of data points here. And I think this, uh, the slides uh, will be shared with everybody later, uh, where I have put in a little bit of a hyperlinks for further, you know, study if you're interested that there are, um, you know, there's a proven path when a, a sustainable company that, that was kind of monitored for the stock indexes considerably outperformed the ones that were just trading in a regular stock exchange. So there is a really, you know, so doing good sometimes also yields in good business. So if we can just move on to the um, the next one. So it's all the drivers, right? So you've heard of most of them because they get quite a lot of coverage, right? So it is quite bad to the reputation when a company is caught, uh, you know, getting engaged in this large fines. But then um, what does it do for me? So if we can just, uh, just go down to say, 
um, you know, so you understand the drivers and these are different groups um, because a risk is not contained within procurement or within compliance, right? It's quite wide. Uh, so there is the, the, you know, the sustainability group. They might say, we need to make sure that our, our supply chain is ethical. Uh, and we hear quite a lot, you know, a lot of companies, um, you know, Nestle's and coffee shops and, and chocolate manufacturers, for example, uh, making conscious effort to have a clean ethical supply chain and not use child laborers, not, you know, wipe out the full farming practices in a small family on farms. Uh, there is another driver around finance group. So, so depending on, you know, what function you're representing today, it's very likely that you are mostly trying to make sure when your company gets audited, that you have a way of proving that you were engaged in some kind of diligence practices and there is uh, some kind of digital or paper trail to, to kind of outline your actions. Then there's the IT. That's another type of risk that your, your IT group is monitoring is their own cyber risk. Is my data secure? Is my customer's data secure? Uh, then you have a procurement. You're looking at your supplier risk, your third-party risk. You might be doing your you know, quality business reviews with your vendors, and you're looking at, do I have any contractual risk here? Do I have anything that indicates that this company is not going to be around for long? Do they have bankruptcies? So things that a procurement is going to be aware of. And then there's the full supply chain group, right? Making sure that what if my supplier shuts down? Do I have a plan B? Do I have different routes of transporting uh, goods and services so that I can meet my, my delivery? So various groups wanting to monitor for risks. So if you just say, I do risk management, right? You really have to ask, well, which function do you represent? Because your needs and the tools you need to do risk management are going to be quite different. Okay. And thank you, Lorena, for driving the slides because it's not, not that fun to be just uh, doing. So if you can just uh, skip through all the animations and you can populate the whole sure. thing. Sure. Okay. Yeah. No problem. And I should have taken out the animations to save you some pain. Um, all right. So this one again around, uh, this is a little bit of a visuals, right? Uh, I have covered some of this already. They're depending on what type of business you do as a company, your uh, focus and risk is going to be different. Uh, if you're not doing a lot of, um, you know, traditional manufacturing, um, there is no assembly lines, you might not be worried so much about, you know, the child labor or the migrant workers, for example. Um, but if you are engaged in financial services, insurance, you know, regular, you know, IT companies, uh, you might be worried about what kind of agency you are doing business with. Where do the workers come from? Um, um, are the subcontractors vetted? Do you have risk of data theft? Um, so, so things like that. So again, risk is dependent on the type of business you do. Not all risk is um, equally um, of high importance. You might say that I want to focus on operational and compliance risk, for example, or you might say I'm really focused on uh, environmental and social risk. Um, it just depends on what, what your needs are and what your driver is for your business growth. That's the type of risk that you'll focus on. Uh, there are barriers, um, again, even though um, most companies do want to engage in healthy uh, third-party supplier base, sometimes there is just, it's too complex, uh, especially if you're looking at the fourth party, right, your supplier suppliers, uh, sometimes very little visibility into who they do business with. Um, and sometimes it can be quite intensive process for you to go through the vetting process. And you might, uh, you know, all of us, we do more with less all the time, right? You're stretched thin and you just might not have time to do a proper diligence. You have different priorities, competing priorities, no cost, transparency, right? Sometimes how do you trust what you are being told is bad, sometimes just being able to prove the ROI that you made a good investment and how do you go back to your stakeholders and show value. So there are a couple of barriers there as well. Um, so I'm going to um, not cover everything here, Lorena, because I do want to be mindful of a little bit of time and cover a little bit more uh, farther down the slide, if that's okay. Yeah, so this is around, again, um, 
yes, the, the risk is changing, the nature of your custom customers, the expectations in the market is changing, your, your CEO, your CFO might have set certain goals for the company to achieve some of the, the socially responsible, right, the corporate citizenship kind of goals. You might be actively complying with some of the FCPA or anti-bribery regulations. Um, but you know, once once you do that, the risk itself and how you manage and how you you um, you know operate the the tools within your system is also changing, right? So you're no longer you know phoning people or trying to get information. You're probably not relying just on self-reported data either. You're probably doing some combination, most likely through multiple vendors, different type of risk data. You might just start with a simple you know a dunce check, right? Or you might just do uh, a financial check. You might ask them a supplier during the onboarding process to report some of the data. But increasingly it becomes, especially if you're a large company and you have 10, 20, 30,000 vendors, that just does not become sustainable. And especially if you have less resources working in your team. So a lot of companies are making move into, you know, let's just make things more automated because we do have the luxury of quite advanced technologies at disposal to make some of the, the risk scoring, the scanning, so more of an identification of a risk process more automated and easy. So you, so we have you know a framework to say well if you are engaged in that you know political economic social technological legal environmental risk this is what a high risk looks like this is what a medium looks like this is what low risk looks like being able to get that scored risk and then just providing the analytics and information for. Um, some a procurement professional, for example, or a compliance professional to look at the score and try to decide what that means for the business and what action to take next. So being able to constantly be to consume that information in an automated way, in a way that is already uh, scored and interpreted for you so that you are not doing a job of reading every single thing that is coming to you and making sometimes a judgment call on how bad it might be for your business. Uh, you might be able to spot different trends um, and say, hey, when I see a company moving in this direction or against certain risk angle, for example, I have seen this trend before and it hasn't ended well for us, right? So being able to spot those trends quickly and alert your stakeholders and your business to make sure that you have a plan B in place or you know what uh, what plans you might have as a risk mitigation and have an open dialogue with your third party to say hey i saw this and what does this mean for us and to engage in business in the future okay and uh, if i just uh, cover a little bit in detail because a lot of these is a little bit high level information but if you go to the next slide uh, we have um, a framework in place and uh, this is again a patented framework around um, a pestle framework around deciding where your risk lives so for example in this wheel you see the environmental um, containing the esg the csr which is the corporate social responsibilities the pollution the waste um, you have legal data, right? data protection, intellectual property, uh, slavery, trafficking. So various, and these are just an example of the type of risk that is um, there out in the market. Again, it's dynamic, it's happening all the time. So it might have been a really clean vendor a few months ago, but all of a sudden you start getting coverage in the media, for example, that is uh, live and that is almost real time. Um, and you start seeing things that are not favorable. Um, whereas traditionally you might have relied on a financial data or a credit report that is always almost a lagging indicator by the time you find out it's almost uh, too late um, because a lot of things has happened for a company to really show a bad financial outcome. So, so being able to categorize, right, are you working within these kind of risk frames and, and Lorena covered early on, you know, the, some of the financial, strategic, regulatory, reputational risks that you might want to monitor for and how do you want to prioritize monitor, monitoring for this risk because again, your goal, your company's goal might be just two or three of them and maybe not all. So you might be actively engaging in monitoring some of these and others can just be in your radar as a low visibility, but something you don't take active action with. Okay. 
And when we go to the other one, again, there are various tools available. Um, it really depends on how deeply you want to engage in the diligence and the risk monitoring process. Uh, you might not apply same level of uh, mitigation and identification plan uh, for all of your vendors. Maybe you do your tiering. Maybe you look at your tier one, tier two vendors and say, for these, I need them to go through this full workflow, which is I want to identify risk. I want to assess for risk. I want to do the enhanced due diligence because you might flag something as being high risk. So then you want to go ahead through this whole workflow of being able to check against various data points and then have this after that to say, well, I checked now, but I'm going to engage in business with this person and this company or this uh, third party. And I want to make sure that I audit, I'm clean, and I want to monitor for risk in a continuous basis. So sometimes you might just do one time check and say, they are good, very clean, low risk, no need for continuous monitoring and move them into your kind of uh, your supplier pool. So depending on who that company is, what it tells you along the way, uh, because a lot of it is also discovery around risk, you, you go ahead and decide uh, which of your uh, third parties or your vendor base do you want to put into the monitoring flow and which you want to do just a one-time risk. So for some, something that is low risk, you might be able to just do a simple check um, around company data. Are they in watch list or blacklist? Uh, who are the executives and maybe your financial health and done. Um, so this is again, and all this is available. This is kind of a circular workflow, even though it looks like a little bit more of a rectangle here, um, but you do move your intelligence and risk through different stages, depending on who they are and how critical they are to your business. Okay, and um, just, um, um, so there's just a few more slides I'll cover, Lorena, before I hand it over to you. Again, this is more of a uh, info for your, for those those of you who want to look at the slides later. There is always this risk that you've done a lot of work into identifying risk, and you've done a thorough check. You have an auditing trail built in. Everything is set, and you engage in business. But a lot of the companies, so it's just 50% of the organizations discover their issues after the completing the due diligence. So this is one of the, uh, the, the facts here. And we have a lot of these companies who have been fined. A lot of them did go through their due diligence process, their risk identification process. They did go through the enhanced workflow perhaps, but since the risk happens over time, uh, they are not getting caught because once you uh, kind of vet your vendor or your supplier and they are in your system, then you stop, right? Because you feel like you've done all the check and it's just kind of you move on to vetting more new vendors at the time and the risk is happening. So this is around being aware that you do need to do a continuous monitoring for risk all the time. And if these are large companies, these are large global companies, millions and millions in uh, fine, and actually 1.78 billion for one of the companies as a fine, that's the largest fine issued. And they, it's just that you, know, you start losing trust, you start losing your reputation in the market, and it just becomes quite impactful uh, to who you are as a business. So there's one last slide I wanted to just kind of give a timeline and um, um, hopefully this is also one of those. If you can just go through all the animations, it's fine because this is kind of painting a timeline and the visual is just, um, and there's one more, that's it. Um, this is just an example of how, um, you know, you might have a, this is just an Airbus example, all the way from 2014 to 2018, uh, you know, investigation starts in Germany, then it moves on to the UK, then it moves on to Austria, then it moves, uh, moves on to France, right? And then it just, and finally it reaches the, the US. Um, and the last step is there is a fine being issued. So $99 million in fine around um, bribery. So a lot of uh, companies, a lot of these regulatory bodies that we touched earlier are truly multinational regulatory bodies. So countries opt in, uh, the agencies opt in to engage uh, and work well with each other. That way you companies no longer can, you know, do, you know, let's just say the, the dirty business in one country and hope that nobody else finds out, right? So this is increasingly become a, becoming a transparent world for better or worse. And the risk is happening 
happening over time. So if you had done your really good diligence in 2014 and 16, the things that are actually worse are happening much later in time. And this is again, a big brand, big global company, you probably wouldn't have missed this, but this can happen into your small companies as well that you're engaging with. And this is just to show you a timeline of how risk is kind of trickling over time and to make sure that you have eye on it all the time and be proactive about identifying these risks. Okay, so Lorena, I think next one is yours. Thanks, Pawana. So a lot of, a lot of information in here and, and why is this so important? Why, um, here's a great quote that we, we like to share, Warren Buffett, it takes 20 years to build a reputation in five minutes to ruin it. So if you think about that, you'll do things differently. And uh, uh, unfortunately, too often, we still see that even if you think about that, you're not gonna, we still find organizations that don't do anything differently until it's, it's too late. So it's more reactive than, than proactive. But what are we talking about when we say, why is this so important? The reason why at LexisNexis, we, uh, we continue to put together these webinars to bring not only what, uh, you know, compiled industry uh, leadership thought, leader, leader, uh, leadership thought like PwC and Accenture and the statistics that we're seeing out there from Nielsen's, and we want to share it with a larger audience coupled with our own, um, you know, day-to-day -day interactions and the experience that we have gained and, and, and anecdotes that we hear from, from customers that we work with every day. Uh, why do we do this? It is because still every single week, um, hardly a week goes by that I don't have a conversation where some organization has not given this priority. Um, uh, whether they're new, whether they really have just been, uh, you know, not not proactive in engaging in this in this way to be more strategic about managing their risk, um, but this is important. And one of the statistics that you should see on the screen, uh, I should have highlighted in yellow because it is so incredibly important. Uh, according to a study conducted by PwC, 80% of all compliance risk originates from third parties. So it doesn't matter collectively how you look at, at compliance risk or risk in general. 80% of all risk comes down to something involving a third party. That is an enormous, enormous st uh, statistic. You can't sweep that away. You can't ignore it. Third party risk is essentially responsible for the birth and evolution of an entire discipline. And this is why third party risk and the mitigation and management thereof is so important. And if altruistic motivations aren't enough to persuade you about the need to manage third-party risk, all you need to do is take a closer look at some of the, the statistics we're sharing with you on the screen right now. They all have one common theme. Third-party risk can impact an organization's bottom line. So whether that's measured in production costs or declining stock prices or a drop in sales, how an organization interacts with the outside world matters, and it matters greatly. Here's, a, here's an example, and I, I think some of these statistics you've seen in some of the previous slides, but again, we, it, this is about reiterating the importance of this. Uh, too often we'll hear about it in the news or we'll, we'll see a newsletter come through and we just kind of glean over it. And the goal here is to compile it all together so that you can see it all strung together and really comprehend the, the magnitude of the importance of third-party risk. Um, so we're talking about that bottom line and we're talking about the impact. The reputational risks here uh, to, uh, to Vinci were 18% drop in their, in their share price, 18%. That's a, that's a tremendous, tremendous uh, numbers drop. And Talia is probably one of the biggest uh, historically that I've seen out there, 965 million to resolve violations, FCPA violations, um, 5 million at AstraZeneca to uh, settle another FCP violation. So it matters because it does at the end of the day impact uh, the bottom line of an organization, whether you want to quantify that in fines or in, in profit margins. And so it's important to really understand 
the risks that your specific organization has based on the industry that you're in, the size of your organization, your global footprint. So this brings us to how do we implement a risk management process? And there's <laughs> there are so many varieties to this, so many different ways that you could uh, go about implementing your risk management process, um, whether it's um, – uh, so risk, whether it's third-party risk or one of the many other flavors of risk, we know that today risk management is, is an integral component of good governance and, and management. It allows an organization to identify strengths and, and uh, weaknesses, and you need to develop an iterative process to achieve your organization's overall objectives. And there are some core steps, like I said, the sky's the limit about how you go ahead and implement, how you go about implementing a process. But consider these four core steps. The first step, and this is, this is where all risk management process really begins, and that is assessing the risk. Um, it is that assessment that's going to determine a lot of things uh, in this development of a risk management process. Once uh, that risk level is assessed, you also have to categorize risk. We've talked a lot, uh, Pawana and I both have talked a little bit about uh, reputational risk, strategic risk, financial uh, risk, so operational risk. So categorizing that risk is, is the next step. You assess the level, you, uh, you categorize the risk, you also then consider the market and the available um, solutions or the available tools for you to help you in, um, in, in that risk management process. And then finally, implementing your strategy. So again, four basic steps if you really are starting ground up with implementing a, man a risk management process. Assess the risk, categorize the risk, consider your options, and four, implement that strategy. So what we have here, this particular diagram illustrates visually, for those of you like, like myself, we're very visual learners, um, what, what uh, risk assessment looks like. So when we're talking about levels of risk, if you have very low risk, and we're talking about third party, 80% of, of risk comes from some third party involvement. So uh, when that interaction with the third party when you've assessed that as being low risk, the amount of due diligence that you need to perform tends to be pretty low risk. And I still today hear a lot of, well, this is pretty low risk, so we're just running a Google search. And if the risk is low, that's acceptable. But when that risk starts going up, when you find degrees, whether it's related to the spend with a third party or the location of a particular transaction uh, or, or the industry, uh, you know, retail, um, construction, especially outside the country, uh, that risk is going to that risk is going to skyrocket, and your due diligence efforts should grow accordingly. They need to expand to meet the level of risk in a particular transaction. And so, what we're seeing here um, is that uh, you can manage that risk across the different categories as well. So the degree of due diligence you may do for an assessed reputational risk interaction may be different than one in a financial risk interaction. So lots of degrees here. And one of the previous slides, Pawana actually had a, a really great slide that she shared. It's a workflow. And it is a, a workflow that we see commonly integrated into compliance policies that essentially serves as the, the groundwork or the workflow for how uh, a company is going to lay out their third-party risk management process. It goes into a lot more detail than what we see here. This is really just about reiterating for you and reinforcing this concept that as your risk grows, so should the level of your due diligence. And again, the visuals. Um, so talking about due diligence, because the first step of, of the, uh, the assessment process then, or the implementing the stages of, of third-party risk management, really begins with, with the initial due diligence. So we're talking about, um, and let me go ahead and do what Pawana did here. Let's look at all of it together. 
the initial do uh, the initial stages or the three stages of the risk mitigation life cycle begins with initial due diligence and this this is really about conducting uh, due diligence on third parties uh, followed by monitoring those third parties and then the periodic reviews so that life cycle it really is a loop it just uh, you're in that perpetual loop there is no beginning and ending it, it is a continual motion to ensure that you're doing everything you can to mitigate that third party risk so taking a look at this a little bit closer when we're talking about the initial due diligence, and this is just another way, again, to reiterate for you what Pawana previously shared, um, managing the incoming checks or the initial due diligence. You want to conduct uh, due diligence on a third party, and this can be done a couple, of, a lot of different ways. The first step is usually to develop or draft some kind of a policy that designates these steps, uh, followed by designating responsibilities. Who within your organization is going to do this? Is this going to be uh, a new team, a third-party due diligence team? Do you want this to sit with procurement if you have a really developed procurement department? Or is this something you feel should be managed by the compliance team? So there can be a lot of dotted lines here in the responsibility and who has ultimate um, ultimate accountability for this motion and these are all things that you get to determine internally as long as someone has been designated these responsibilities and the next step from there is selecting resources and these these are usually outlined in in the initial policy um, so if you determine that low risk you're going to go ahead and rely on Google that should be identified. But once you have a third party uh, that you've identified through questionnaires or an application process that uh, is at a tier one or tier, tier two level, you know you have to go into a more developed due diligence program um, to assess the level of risk. And critical data points here, well, now we're at the point where we're talking about critical data points, including include verifying data that a third party provides you. So let's speak tangibly, I guess, at this point about what due diligence or initial due diligence looks like. It's about collecting data. It's about verifying the data they provide you. It's about screening for those uh, smoking gun hits, the red flags, uh, things like showing up on a sanctions list is an immediate red flag. Uh, negative news is, is increasingly an important, uh, important resource as part of that initial due diligence program. You want to check politically exposed persons lists. And this is one that uh, uh, sometimes surprises um, uh, the audience when we're uh, working with them. Why do I need to check PEPs? If you're dealing with organizations, if you know that there could be some um, global nature to a transaction, you need to make sure that you know who you're doing business with. It is so easy to fall into violations, FCPA violations in particular, something that could just be a common custom uh, in, your, in your own country, like paying for lunch after a business meeting, uh, could render that simple act a violation of the FCPA just by virtue of a political connection. So something as innocent as that is, is, is uh, uh, suddenly something that puts your organization in jeopardy of some significant fines. So PEPs are a fairly important part of that conversation. And of course, obvious things like criminal records. And then it's not enough to verify data to perform this initial due diligence, you actually have to prove that you conducted that due diligence. It's just part of establishing an audit trail or compliance trail um, for, for audit purposes. You just want to make sure that everything you've done to try to ensure the security of this transaction is documented for, for, future, uh, for future reference. And so then we have once you take a, a, a party through that first initial due diligence, uh, depending on your risk appetite, you know, the culture of your organization and how conservative you want to be or aggressive with your compliance program, you may decide that you want to monitor all third parties. Um, most clients are at the very least monitoring their tier one, their highest risk. And so um, part of this entails uh, determining whether your volume is so large that you should be looking at an automated versus a manual program. 
Uh, there are lots of options uh, in between there as well. And critical data considerations here, again, determined by the level of risk and the culture of, of your organization. Uh, this is usually monitoring media, monitoring sanctions, sometimes monitoring legal as well, legal content, just for litigation, uh, critical legal events. But this is an ongoing process. So think of it as an alert. Think of it, uh, you know, again, there are some automated systems out there that incorporate the PESL framework that Pawana shared with us, with us earlier that has a lot of technology, a lot of uh, machine, to meet, machine learning uh, working behind the scenes so that there's a framework to the information that you're receiving as the person responsible for the ongoing monitoring. So definitely a, a, a step beyond just a, a manual alert. And then once you've got that machine in place, that motion, if you will, of this, this process where you perform your initial due diligence, you've made them part, you've made this third party part of that ongoing monitoring process, uh, now you should probably schedule a periodic review um, motion as well. And this could be for data cleansing priorities uh, as well as just a random ad hoc audit review. Um, a lot of clients will utilize a contract renewal uh, as the trigger for performing that periodic rev review. So that just before they renew a, a contractual relationship, they do that quick check again and ensure that there isn't uh, something that's changed since the last time that perhaps the enhanced due diligence took place. And so here things to consider, <clears throat> excuse me, or access are things like company databases to update uh, company information, automated screens against, again, sanctions, PEPs, or uh, even deeper investigations uh, are, are available, uh, would make sense at this level. And I think I left us just a little bit of time for some questions today. Um, and just to summarize real uh, uh, quickly, um, and I think this, uh, this is a poll that might have just come up on your screens as well. Um, let's see here. Again, just a reminder real quick, if you do have a question, feel free to go ahead and type those questions uh, into uh, the question box, and uh, we'll take those. Um, we do have one question. Did you have something else before we go ahead and take our question? No, I was just going to thank everyone for their for their time and attendance today. We really appreciate the opportunity to share some some of what we've learned along the way. Perfect. Before we go ahead and take that question here, just uh, again, we do have that poll up. Um, are you interested in saving up to forty percent? Uh, we have the yes or not right now option. We'll go ahead and leave this poll up for um, just a little bit. Go ahead and feel free to answer that poll. Um, <clears throat> uh, we do have a question here. What types of InfoSec reviews are best practiced during the initial due diligence phase of the life cycle? Uh, Lorena, do you want me to look at that one? Um, the first Was one. It, yeah, I'm not sure that I heard that correctly. Do you mind repeating that? Absolutely. What type of InfoSec reviews are best practiced during the initial due diligence phase of the life cycle? One, are you familiar with InfoSec reviews? Yeah, I'm assuming you're looking at the information security. Uh, that's the, the usual shorthand for that data. Uh, so this is, um, so it just looks like what type of content, uh, right? So this is, it is one type of content. Uh, usually we, we, actively advise our customers not to rely on one data point to make uh, a business decision, especially on risk identification, right? This usually lands you in the same, um, you know, position as just looking at financial health or just looking at news data. Um, so um, there are uh, services available, right? And, and since we are LexisNexis, we are quite uh, one of the largest aggregator of content that you might be able to find um, here. But uh, we always say, right, uh, search your your third party, your entity through multiple data sources and not just one, uh, for example, an InfoSec or just a credit data, right? Just as a best practice. 
Okay. We do have another question here, but before that, again, we do have a polling question. Um, are you interested in saving up to 40%? Again, the options are yes or not right now. Um, the second question here, uh, what due diligence do you recommend if you are operating in a country which has low levels of regulations and most suppliers have very little paperwork to start with? So we're talking about low regulations and suppliers have very little paperwork. There's, there's the challenge. Um, at the very least, uh, basic contact information. There are systems out there um, that allow you to, to perform basic searches. I think at its core, you want to check sanctions lists, uh, PEP lists, and uh, if you don't have a subscription service, uh, you know, like Tuana mentioned, where Lexus, Nexus, we offer solutions like Nexus Diligence that, that allow you to do that deep dive into aggregated data around the world. But if you don't have that, um, at its core, you really should be trying to run a Google search um, and access some of the, the core sanctions lists um, uh, just, just to ensure, especially if you're not getting a lot of data from the supplier to begin with. Um, that's sort of a basic, basic level check. Yeah, and I would also add that, right, it might just be a market that you're not familiar with or the regulation, um, but a lot more countries, right, so especially with that the UN goals are, you know, kind of opting in into having certain elements of data identifiable about the, the companies, right, a lot of it is tied into the aids that they receive, right, so if you want this, then you have to do this kind of, you know, uh, the settlement arrangement there. Uh, at the very least, um, you can check in their own local language, right, so if it is really a obscure company in a, and their uh, languages, right, let's just say it's not in English, you're not getting coverage in a major world publications, for example, you might be able to go all the way down into local, there must be some kind of news coverage around who that um, company might be, who that person might be, and that is probably your broadest coverage. And like Lorena said, sanctions and watch lists are also quite global. And there are agencies operating in a lot of countries now where they are reporting data up into who are being fined and sanctioned. So, so there is a lot more that is available perhaps behind a firewall or a paywall uh, that you might not just find in your Google search, but lot, it's a lot difficult to do business in a global uh, economy these days and not have anything to tie you back into who you are. Oh, we do have another question here. Um, is there contractual language that you incorporate into the agreements with these vendors that allow termination of the relationship due to vendor deficiencies as prioritized by the third party risk tolerance policy? Um, I can um, answer that uh, from, you know, so I've had uh, experience working previously in other companies where I did work with supplier management program and a contract management program for the vendor. Um, I have seen that kind of language being mandated by a customer. So they do perform their own supplier uh, rating. So they look at the supplier performance management. And one of the, the things that they will tie into is risk. So even if you are performing really, really well against your own measurement criteria, but you violate one of your uh, whatever you, you put in, in your clause, right? So you, you should not be engaged in, let's just say, you know, environmental or kind of some kind of uh, financial reputational um, activities. You can put that as your contract. So if you do find them violating or engaging in practices that your company does not agree with, that can be something you can address heads on. Yeah. All right. Looks like we don't have any other questions at this time. Um, did uh, did either one of you have any other final thoughts before we go ahead and wrap up? No, but I also wanted to thank everybody for their afternoon, and thank you for letting us share. All right. Perfect. With that, I'd like to thank, uh, thank both of our speakers for their time and expertise. A copy of this webinar will be archived on Opposite within a few days. Thank you for joining the conference today. Have a wonderful afternoon.